Welcome back everyone. Today we're talking about material properties. So we'll talk about how to make new materials, how to define new properties, and we'll do a short viscoelastic analysis just to test it out. To get started with material properties, first we need to create an analysis object. So let's first drag out a static structural and all my material properties will be within my engineering data here. So I'll double click on engineering data and we can see that there's a predefined material as always of structural steel. So the first thing that I'd like to do is I would like to add other pre-programmed materials. So right over here, there's something called engineering data sources. We can click on that. And it has a whole library of predefined materials for us. So I'll go to general materials right here. And the materials that are within that library are defined right down here. So here's our outline of materials. So we can see that this library of general materials contains 14 different materials within it. So if I want to add one of these materials, let's say I want to add aluminum alloy. So I'll scroll to the top, I'll click on aluminum alloy, and I'll hit the little plus sign here. And you'll see the book shows up right there. That means it's been added to my model as engineering data. And if I scroll down, you'll see structural steel down here has automatically already been added for me. So that was already there when I created this model. And you can look in other material libraries and see what else is there. So for example, if I have a general nonlinear material, Let's say I have a nonlinear structural steel. I can also add that. So once you're done defining predefined materials, you can close your engineering data sources. Just click right here. And that brings you back to your list of materials. So I've defined aluminum alloy, structural steel. Both of those are linear materials. They have no plasticity. And then I also have nonlinear structural steel. We can see that it has an extra bilinear isotropic hardening with a yield strength and tangent modulus that is modeling the post yield behavior. Now let's create a custom material from scratch. So to do that, click right here in the final row of your material table. I'll just call this material one, hit enter, and now material one is ready to be defined, but you'll notice it has a question mark because it has absolutely no properties. So to assign a property, we can select our material and then double click on a property over here on the left. So you can scroll down. There's a ton of different options that you can assign for properties. We'll start with some of the basics. We'll define a density. So I'll double click on that density. And here I can assign my value for density. Now you could change the units to whatever you want. The unit system here in your material properties is completely independent from your analysis units. So ANSYS will handle all the unit conversions for you so use whatever's most convenient for defining your material properties. So I'm gonna use pounds per cubic foot. Let's say it's 150 pounds per cubic foot. And if you want, and this is totally optional, you can change that unit system to whatever you want. For example, kilograms per cubic meter, it automatically updates the value for me. Now let's define the properties that we need for a viscoelastic simulation. So first I'm gonna need some elasticity for this. So you'll notice that my materials disappeared over here on the left. That's currently because I'm editing my density. And within the density, you can assign field variables. For example, if you want your density to vary as a function of X. If we don't want that, let's click back on the material that brings back up your full material list. And I would like some linear elastic behavior. Let's do isotropic elasticity. So instead of double clicking, you can also click and drag it over to the property box here. And that does the same thing. So here you'll notice I have to define my Young's modulus and my Poisson's ratio. You can, if you have other properties, define any combination of two of your four moduli. So if I want to define my bulk and shear modulus, that works just fine as well. But I'll stick with Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio. Let's define it in PSI. And let's say it's 5 million. So six zeros on that for my Young's modulus. And then my Poisson's ratio is 0.2. You'll notice it automatically calculates your bulk modulus and shear modulus down here. Now let's define our viscoelasticity. So again, I'll click on material one. We'll put some prony shear relaxation in there. I won't do any volumetric relaxation, so I'm only having shear relaxation. So I'll drag that out to my property. Now this is going to define a relaxation function for my material. If you're ever concerned with or have no idea what a material property does because there are so many of them and, and many of them are quite detailed, you can go to the help menu. So if I click on my home here, uh, I have a link here to ANSYS Help 2020 R2 and it should just show up in your ANSYS menu right here if you already have it installed. Once you're in the help, you can always search for specific material properties or we can just go to 
mechanical APDL. Click on that. And we can have a material reference right here that should describe all your possible material properties. Now, in this case, I'm doing viscoelasticity. So that's a nonlinear material property. And here is viscoelasticity, so I'll click on that. And then it will describe the viscoelastic formulation right here. So it's using a generalized Maxwell model. And then it tells you the description of each of the properties that you can define. So we'll have a summation of a number of exponential terms where we have a relative modulus right here and then also a relaxation time right here. So what I'm going to do for this case is I'll have three terms in this equation. So I'll need to define three relative moduli and then three relaxation times for that each of those exponential terms. So going back to the workbench, I said I wanted three terms for this, so we'll change this to three. And there's a table over on the right, so I'm going to disappear for just a second and we'll see that there's a table right over here where I can define the properties for those three terms. So I can define my relative moduli and my relaxation time for each of those exponential terms. So the relative moduli is the total relaxation that is built into that relaxation time component in our Maxwell model. So let's say I have 50% of the relaxation on a relaxation time of one second. I have another 20% of my relaxation on a relaxation time of 20, 10 seconds. And then I have another 20% of my relaxation on a relaxation time of 100 seconds. So I'll jump back in. Down here, you'll see that there's a, a relaxation curve plot, but it's only plotted for up to one second. So if you right click on that X axis, you can change it, it'll edit properties, and we'll turn off the automatic range so I can set this so it goes from zero to, let's say a thousand seconds, so that I can see what it's going to be doing. And over 1,000 seconds, you can see it relaxes quite quickly and it reaches some asymptotic relaxation here, which is 10% of my original modulus, 10% because I've relaxed in total 90% of my original modulus right here. All right, so now we have our viscoelastic and elastic properties. So let's create a very simple model with this material one so that we can do a viscoelastic analysis. So I can close my engineering data and I'll create some really basic geometry. So for this example, I'll have a very simple geometry. It's 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters square for the cross section and 100 millimeters long. So let's put this into ANSYS. Now in ANSYS, I'd like to change the material for my one part here. So let's open up our geometry. We have a solid. And currently the material assignment is structural steel. Let's change that to material one. And as usual, if you want to see a list of all your materials, they're defined here where it will give you that summary of your material properties. Now let's do a quick mesh. I'm just gonna use a default mesh. Next thing I'd like to do is I'd like to do some viscoelastic analysis. So first thing I'll do is I'll click down here on static structural and I'll define, we'll pull that down, we'll define some boundary conditions and a force. So let's create a fixed support here at this end and I'll apply and then I'll rotate this thing around and I'll apply a force load at the other end and I'll hit apply. Now for the magnitude, I'm just gonna leave that blank for right now because I would like to do this in a variety of load steps because that is really the only time viscoelastic analysis is interesting. So let's go to our analysis settings. So in those analysis settings, you'll see this first thing called step controls. We start with one step, which means we have one load application. I'm going to change that to three steps. And down here, there's a table and I'll pull it up a little bit so we can see it a little bit better that lets you define the time for each step. So I'm gonna say step one goes from zero by default up to 100 seconds. Step two, oh, and it won't let me do that because it's greater than it. So you have to go backwards. So I'm gonna go from step three at 300 seconds, 200 seconds, and 100 seconds. Now I'd like to break those steps into something called sub steps so that we can get a little bit more information about our solution. So if I go back over here for my step control, my current step number is one. There's an auto time stepping that's program controlled. Technically for this sort of analysis, you don't need any auto time stepping, but I'd prefer to break this into sub steps. So I'll turn that on and it will define it by sub steps. And just for this example, I'd like to have 10 sub steps per step. And I don't want that to change. So I'm just gonna set initial sub steps to 10. The minimum will also be 10 and the maximum will be 10, which means it will always do 10 sub steps. It has no option to change that. 
Now, tediously enough, you have to do this for each of your steps, so go to step two. Let's change the auto time stepping. If you double click on it, it'll go to the next op option in that menu, so that turns to on. Make this 10, 10, and then step three. Turn that on, and then 10, and 10, so that we'll see all 10 sub steps. Now that we have our time variable defined, let's go back to our force. And I'd, I'd like my force to vary with time. So if I go to my force, let's define this in terms of components. So instead of a vector, we'll do components. And I'm going to be applying my force in the Z direction. And so let's apply 100 Newtons. So it's compressive in this case. And I'll notice over here in the table that it lists out my load application as it varies with the steps. So at time zero, it's zero. And at time 100 seconds, it's 100. And let's ramp it back down at step two. So let's ramp this back down to zero. And you'll notice it also updates step three. So that's zero now. So effectively what I'm doing, and you can see it in the graph here, is I'm going to ramp my load up to 100 Newtons over 100 seconds, and then I'm gonna ramp it down, and then I'm going to see my recovery after the fact, so this will be a zero load condition, but we'll still see strain because we have a viscoelastic material and it's recovering. All right, so we're ready to go. Let's hit solve. Let's check out our deformation. So I really want just a total deformation here and I'll plot that. Now by default, it's going to give you your total deformation at your final time step. So right here, it has a definition by time and the display time is last, but you can change that display time. So if I want to change that to 100, for example, and I resolve that, then it will give me a plot of my displacement at 100 seconds. So let's set that back to 300 seconds. So again, that's my displacement at the end of my analysis. You can see down here that there is a plot with respect to time where it gives me my maximum here in green, my average displacement and my minimum displacement here. Because this is a very simple problem, I know that my maximum displacement is corresponding to the displacement at this far end. However, it might be a little bit more interesting to get the results at a specific point. So let's instead create a probe. So I'm going to create a deformation probe and I'm gonna select this end that's being forced and I'll hit apply. And the results that I want to output for my probe are my Z axis displacements and I'll hit solve. Perfect. And now we can see in the plot that I have the Z axis displacement at that location. And we can see that it varies with time from 200 to 300. That's my recovery time. So it is still strain. It's still the C strain, but it's actually recovering at that point. And I could take this information if I want, and I can copy that into an Excel table. I can copy cells or I can even just export it as an Excel document. Now, if you're doing different analysis types, the types of materials and material options will change for you automatically. So for example, if I want to do a transient thermal analysis, I'll just pull an independent one down here and I double click on engineering data. Again, for structural steel, that's automatically defined, but you'll notice instead of defining elasticity properties, we have a density an isotropic thermal conductivity and a specific heat. As usual, if we want predefined materials, you can click on engineering data sources, and there's a wide range of materials that you can define here. Thermal materials in particular has a long list of 63 materials of different density, conductivity, and specific heat. So just for fun, I'll add zinc, and I'll close out of my engineering data sources, and so now I notice that I have stru structural steel and zinc in my thermal analysis. Similarly, if you're creating, for example, an electric analysis, if I go into engineering data there, I'll notice that my structural steel has isotropic resistivity, and that's actually it. And my options for different material properties is pretty slim. I can have isotropic or orthotropic resistivity. If you're interested in fluid dynamics and CFD, for example, if I wanna create a fluid flow fluent model, you'll notice that it does not work the same way. So there's no engineering data here and the data is directly defined in your model later on. So fluid CFD in ANSYS works quite a bit differently from the other packages. So that's really a separate topic on its own and that's not covered here. And that is it for material properties. So as always, thanks for watching, please subscribe and I will see you next time.